and I do have a big hand, so thank you for giving that to me. Um, you got okay back there? Alright. Yeah, it's nice to be starting out in comedy at 64 years of age. I can't see you anyway, so I might as well take these off. <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, you may be worried that I'll get discouraged, but I have a 20-year plan. In 20 years, if I don't get on Johnny Carson, I quit. <laughs> so, I, said, I, I, was out for, I won't say which one it was, but the address was 800 Larkin Street. Uh, there was an open mic, and they have a lot of, um, what's the nice word, street people up the front. Now, I saw a comedian walking back and forth, and she was wearing an off-the-shoulder dress that was very tight, and it was only this long. And I thought, that's nice that she's dressed up to do her set, but people might think she's a hooker. And then she came over to me and told me she could do a job for me for this three dollars. So she wasn't a hooker. And um, <laughs> the, the panhandlers wanted me to get a slice of uh, pizza for them, and that was three fifty. Now, if there's a price war between the panhandlers and the hookers, we really are in a recession. <laughs> My daughter's here. I'm so proud of her. Uh, she was once in a profession that is one of the few that's lower than lawyer or politician or crack whore. She was a insurance salesperson. <laughs> and uh, we kidnapped her, had an intervention, sent her to rehab. Uh, and so now she's thinking about what her next career is going to be. She's considering bank robbery. <laughs> and I'm encouraging her in it because really the only people who are getting away with robbery these days are the banks. <laughs> so, but she's given me her daughter, her, her, yeah. <laughs> she's my daughter, it's a dog. She's given me her dog to take care of, named Co, her co-pilot. Um, and he's a, he's a really, really special dog. He'll come and lie at my feet. If I go someplace else, he'll go there and lie at my feet. I'll go someplace else and he'll lie at my feet. I've never had a woman like that in my life. <laughs> that didn't strike that. <laughs> that was again. Whoa, what a fuck. Anyway, uh, he was running out of food and Grace Elizabeth, my daughter, is very fussy about what he eats, what exact brand, and he's supposed to get two kinds and mix it together. So I found the pet store that had it. And I asked the guy at the pet store, what, what is it that with these? They said, well, this one is very, very nutritious. And this one makes his stool more solid. So two grown men talking about the caca of a dog. Yes. <laughs> so I go home and I feed the dog. And I started having this one uh, half a cup for breakfast every morning. And time went on, and I still couldn't get my shit together. <laughs> so, um, according to the Geneva Convention, the dog gets to go for a walk every time I go in the house and go out of the house. It's just a law. So I hook him up, and we go for a walk, and we walk and we walk. But on the walk, he's supposed to do something. And he's supposed to do one thing as many times as he wants, and he's supposed to do the other thing at least once. Right? Okay. So we're walking along, and the walk is supposed to stimulate his system to make it happen. Right? But it's not stimulating him fast enough. The problem is it's stimulating me. So here I am. Do I go back to the barn with the dog unemptied? and have to come out again, or do I try to tough it out? And it gets to be the human existential condition. If you throw in the word existential, it really classes up the act. <laughs> the human existential condition. And I feel myself on the verge of losing control. And I say, hmm, perhaps if I could just emit a little methane gas, it would take the pressure off. You know, like Obama taking some troops out of Afghanistan to take the pressure off. But just like Obama, there's always the risk that you could wind up with a bigger mess than you started with. <laughs>
don't know. I can put the tubes back in. But I can't put the stuff I can't put it back in. <laughs> so I'm encouraging the dog and I I discussed this existential moment with everybody I've met in the line at Safeway and I went back to the to the pet store and, and I talked it with my pastor and and, and and everybody agreed. We need to go back to a time when we could just pull on our trousers and squat wherever we are. <laughs> I mean that proves uh, that proves the theory of evolution. Once upon a time, we didn't have any pants. And we could do wherever we wanted, wherever we wanted, and just move on. <laughs> proving the theory of evolution. But I believe people are created because my children were created on schedule, like smart bombs. <laughs> That's how the modern child is uh, appropriated, you know? You didn't know that? I'll tell you about the second one, Grace Elizabeth, since she's here. Uh, my wife comes in, her mother comes in, not her mother at the time because she hadn't been impregnated yet. And when life begins, certainly doesn't start before conception. You know, I'm, anyway, I'm confused. I don't want to confuse you. Yes, I do. No, I don't. Anyway, anyway, she comes in and she says, Get up, I'm ovulating. This is so sexy. <laughs> it's 2 o'clock in the morning. Can we go to the afternoon? No, right now. The baby's asleep. And we got to go out to the living room so we don't wake him up. And, no, I've been storing up for three weeks. <laughs> Keep the sperm count up, right? You don't want to just dribble it off at every page. And so, you know, I'm ready theoretically, but I've been out of practice. And I'm just two o'clock in the morning. I gotta get up at seven. Tell me how, how long is this gonna take? <laughs> you know, men are always on for sex. Don't believe it. Because it's just if you want to have a baby. This is the minute. Come on! So, I must have come through because that was the only possibility that we had in all of the period of time because after that, the baby woke up every night. Anyway, both the theory of evolution and creationism are totally true. I can prove it in my life. So, bless you.